will be about will be sorry um bringing together bringing together um the future past and presence of histories of bilston um linking it to industry the workforce um the opportunities that are available for young people and creatives in the area and also thinking about reskilling as well so it's a kind of a long-term project and this is just the start um, so please do um, check, check us out. We're at Bilston Art Project. If you're on Instagram, it's at Bilston Art Project, all one word. Um, and I'd, what I'd like to do now is to introduce um, Iris and Sharon and John, who are going to be talking about um, the work that they've made um, for the Bilston Art Project. And they're going to be in conversation with John as well, who has quite a few connections to, to Bilston and Enamels. So um, it's going to be really great. And I'd love to hand over to our our speakers now so thank you um thank you gavin thanks very much for the welcome and um i'll take over from you and just forgive me hopefully my internet won't collapse on me so that's happened before um welcome to tonight my name is iris birds i'm a graduate from wolverhampton i did my master's in 2000 at wolverhampton so i'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey of my career my sort of life in the arts and how I got really obsessed um, about the Bilston enamels. So you, many of you in this room probably know much more about the Bilston enamels than myself. So I'm gonna just put my screen share up. Oh my God, I don't know. I can't see it now, hang on. Ali, we're already, because we couldn't do our technical rehearsal today, couldn't we? Give me a sec, I'll just put my, here it is. So here it comes. So that's where the connection all started. So when I heard, when we heard the call out for the um, Bilston Art Project, it was really properly exciting. And um, I've been working with Sharon for the last year. So we kind of talked about applying for this and thinking of a collaborative project, but I wanted to take you right back. This is 2000, um, the graduation at um, Wolverhampton Art School. Well, you probably know where this is. This is not at the art school. But there's myself, my cousin Connie, um, Elvin Mark, Hong Kong, Canada, and also Victis Oyen from Trondheim in Norway. And we graduated together in a art and design network. So immediately started to work collaborative across subject matters. Um, I began before that really having studied um, art history and sort of given up on being an academic, realizing that that's not who I am. And I was apprenticed to be a basket maker, which is a really unusual thing, but sort of the whole idea with craft really started there for me. So this is an example of my work quite early on. Um, I immediately wanted to sort of throw the frame out of the window and started to doing some really mad stuff. So <laughs> this is a piece at Tilbury Power Station. It took two days to make with the community. As you can see the scale of it, we made it on day one with volunteers. We drove off site, we came back. Oh, it's still autumn. We came back and it was gone. Sorry, now my computer just do something. Oh, sorry. Let me just redo this. Apologies. I just need to say this. So we drove off site. The, the, um, the piece was gone and how can such a big piece be gone it can't so basically the wind blew it away and we recouped it and it became a um it actually became a bird refuge which was a really lovely thing to have a tilbury power station and they wanted it because they started to burn willow instead of coal so they wanted to have the sustainability issue um this one is me working in Brazil, Santa Catarina, the home of apple growing and also willow growing because they had a lot of um, immigrants from Italy and Germany. So they wanted to sort of build their skill. Again, I was teaching traditional skills, but I was also, again, sort of stretching what we were doing. So we're making a big apple there, which was shown on Apple Day. Now, now there it is, you know, the beloved building, which um, I have to say, I completely love it. And it always brings back memories. I always drive that way around in Wolverhampton. Even, even if I don't go there, I drive past it. Um, this is one of the pieces that I today found out. Um, I shared an exhibition space with John Grayson's work. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, apologies for this. 
it, I just, it doesn't want to do it. It doesn't want to do what I want me to do. So this piece was from my MA. It's sort of as big as I can fit into it. And it was very much about identity, trying to um, really find out who we are through art. Is this a piece I did for my MA show called Absence? Very much, and here starts the interest for me around the enamels is that I really de-skilled myself to do this piece, to go past the beauty. I'm always interested in, about going past the beauty rather than just sort of um, looking at beautiful things. This was in 2000, it was a pretty serious piece. I think everybody was really scared. I wasn't well, but I was okay because it was very dark. Um, here working with my ceramic friends on the materials on the walls. After that, again, the collaboration on Wolverhampton really never left me. So I've worked in Norway here with my colleague, Victor Oyen on a celebration or sort of amusing on the regeneration of Trondheim fishing port, which was being regenerated, regenerated like many areas in this world and just sort of all skills deleted. I need to hold this. Um, 2010, Creative Partnerships was in full flow, which was a project working in schools. Again, collaboration. We did the big draw. We did a massive draw. We decided to go properly wild on this. So this is in a school in Walsall where we really expanded the idea of making and the arts. Again, the arts, bringing the arts to um, Walkwood Middle School in Redditch. Here we were exploring maths, um, sort of, testing subjects really through the arts. And this is one of the installations we did. It was a big dinner party for all the children in year nine. I wish this wouldn't change so quickly. Sorry about this, but I then started doing walks in 2013, again, looking at the not so beautiful. So looking at the sort of what you don't see beautiful. This is, the, uh, this is jewelry quartz in Birmingham, looking at sort of layers of history, Looking at the um, industrial history, 2019, I'm back at Wolverhampton here. Um, I'm back at um, the School of Art. I'm doing, did a walk as part of Arts Fest. And this was very much about seeing as an artist, again, seeing the beautiful in the maybe not so beautiful. Then in this year in the pandemic, just before the pandemic, I set up an arts organization with help from Gavin as well, and Sharon, as you can see, with a sort of a collaborative team of artists interpreting history, creating new art around working class venues, those kind of places that maybe not celebrated. One of our biggest projects was Dreaming Tower Ballroom to date. So we investigated the Tower Ballroom in Birmingham, which is a venue that was going to be, is, is earmarked for demolition, but it's a venue with almost 200 years history. It was a roller skating rink and then loads of famous people performed in there. So now I'll get you to the cats. I'm just going to stop it here. So I'll talk to you a bit of, about the cats. So how did the cats start? So we definitely, um, we were definitely in lockdown, we were working on Dreaming Tower Ballroom. I've always knitted all my life. And it's very much that sort of woman's skill that is a bit like, oh, well, knitting, it's not really serious. I decided lockdown, it was going to be three months. I'm going to buy lots of wool. And I started knitting socks. And my friend had sent me a beautiful parcel. And I thought normally I would go out, buy something nice, send something back. I was locked down. So I thought, I'm going to knit a cat because we've recently become cat people. So I was not infected with a cat disease for a long time, but I've become a complete cat person. So I knitted these cats and I'm still knitting these cats called loosely Corona cats. They have all sorts of names. They're the cat army. They've traveled to people who need the cats. I'll show you one here. This is so there's one. This is the original one. And they've always stayed with me. They've always there. We talked about it in our artistic meetings and people said, do something with the cats. And I was kind of thinking, I wasn't ready for them to be released. So when the project happened, I don't know what happened. I sort of built them. 
I sort of, so, um, enamels, I talked a lot to Sharon who also shares the cat passion. And the cat enamels were born somehow. So we started to look at enamels in Bilston. In my head, when I looked at, when I thought about enamels, I thought about shiny surfaces. And what we found were these things with these messages. And I thought, these are so contemporary. They're completely contemporary. They're like, these could be on an Instagram. I'm gonna just go back and, um, these could be on an Instagram. If you, for example, um, if you look, um, if you look at this one here, time is precious. That could be an Instagram post. Nobody, none of, you know, all these influencers or live of life happy, like lay hold on time while in your prime. So it's a really, I was completely blown away by these. So most of these are actually um, from the Wolverhampton collection. And I'm particularly enamored by this and probably John knows what this says in the corner where we don't know what it says. It says do well, I think, but that's about what I can see. I don't know if, can you see the pan, can you see this panel here? It says do well, and I have no idea do well in what. So I was completely enamored with this idea that people were giving each other these precious things with messages on and also spend a lot of time on auction sites and eBay and looking at things. So I cannot recommend that. Don't do that because you're gonna spend your money on very small things that are, which are absolutely exquisite. And we got very interested in the idea who made them and who painted them. So one of the things we found, we got really, really interested in were these strange characters. So who is the, who is, for example, who is that, um, Lion child, Sharon and I were wondering about. What does that mean? What does this story mean? Or why is the lady riding a goat? As you can see, this is like when I was spending time on auction sites. So, but again and again, we come back to this beauty and this beauty of painting. And then in my searches, of course, I also came across a basket. So I had to put it in because I know that people have been making basket shapes from different materials, but I always find it deeply fascinating. So that sort of was our journey with the enamels. And looking kindly, Wolverhampton Art Gallery helped us greatly with finding their work and sharing images, and they've been fantastic. And we came across these. Now these completely blew me and blew us, Sharon and me, I think they're really small. I think they're about this big. They're really small. And for me, I'm thinking of a woman making these, painting these, and how the shape of the face has sort of taken on the shape of this form, whatever it is. I think John knows much more about these, but I just suddenly could, the maker was in the room. I could think of the maker. So we were really interested in this tension about women's work, knitting, not worth very much. And often the women are also forgotten in this, you know, the women who have probably painted this and also women are represented. So this is where our first piece really came from. This is um, Remember the Maker, Remember when, you, when This You See. So we kind of worked around the themes of those messages on the enamels and then put our cats in because the cats standing for the soft, the cats standing for the hand knitted, the homemade, they're sort of worthless almost. And the enamels representing for us that richness, I would say, that kind of stamped, you know, that is recognized valuable, while probably what women's work normally like knitting isn't recognized valuable. And of course, we had to do something about love because we felt like love was a theme that was running through all the um, enamels. So this is these are two of the pieces that are going to be displayed in Bilston. So I wanted to share these with you and a little bit my journey, how somebody who's really a producer came to this. And this is just to um, say thank you to you and you know one of the team members who've inspired us very greatly in this journey, um, saying goodbye to you. So that's me. I don't know how I did on time, Ollie. I'll just 
stop sharing. That was great, yeah. Okay. So I think next we're on to Sharon G. Yeah, hi, yeah. I'm Sharon G. Um, I graduated from the University of Wolverhampton in 2017 um, as a graphic design student, or well, graphic design graduate, I guess. Um, yeah, so like Iris, I'm gonna go through my journey as a creative and how we got into working together. So I'll just share my screen. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's kind of strange because for me and Iris, we come from like different eras um, of graduates, but we kind of, we can kind of relate to each other not a lot, which I'll go through as we speak about stuff. So. Yeah, I, I kind of like got into graphic design because I really wanted to be an artist, but everyone was like, oh, you can't get a job being an artist, that's not a real job. Um, so I kind of just did my degree in graphic design. But I found that I wasn't really into the whole consumerist side of stuff. So I wasn't interested in selling trainers or Coca-Cola. So I wanted to kind of turn things on their heads and use um, my graphic design skills for something else. Um, yeah. So one of the things I really love is satire. So for one of my projects, I was looking into how um, we consume social media. So trying to think of objects that we consume every day and turning that into a product, basically. And I thought cereal was a really good one because we wake up every morning, we have our cereal. We wake up every morning, we scroll through our phone. Um, so yeah, so there's like different, I was putting like different like facts and stuff all over the cereal box and like having like, oh, you can have Instagram, Flatebook, <laughs> like other things that you could probably buy. Yeah, and another thing I'm really interested in is people watching and kind of, human behavior really fascinates me. So I did this thing called Small Stories, where basically I observed people on my way, way to uni on the way back. I made all these observations about my journey. Um, so like there was a club, an adult club on the way back home from uni that used to go past. You see it all lit up and it was meant to be adult world, but the tea had fallen off because it has been there for ages. And it was a bit dilapidated. So it just said a dull world. And I just thought it was like really funny that like maybe people go in there just to do their tax returns and pay their bills or whatever. So it was just like little observations like that. And there was like one woman who was just getting into a clown costume in the middle of Birmingham High Street. And a man was an accordion playing really crazy music at the same time. And it was just like absolutely absurd. So I love like documenting things. That's like one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, um, and for about a year and a half, um, well, a year and a bit, I was working for a school in, in um, Bilston called Mosley Park. And uh, I got to do a lot of stuff that kind of was more impactful. And I kind of felt like I could make art that had an impact, but it's graphic design, but it's kind of art at the same time. So one of the campaigns um, I did was Black Writers Matter because we don't have enough representation of people of color or black writers in the school curriculum. Um, so yeah, and then here's a picture of me and Iris. <laughs> posing in front of all the posters that are pasted up. Which uh, brings me on to how I started working with Iris. I've worked on another, a number of community projects with Iris that are kind of about preserving working class communities around Birmingham. And Voices of B16 was a really good project because it was kind of, kind of trying to preserve communities that might be prone to gentrification for like many reasons and just trying to preserve that working class, that working class community. So like, I'm, you probably noticed that I like making an amalgamation of things. So we kind of made this um, interactive map, which is on the site and kind of shows people's different stories because I'm really interested in stories that people have. Um, this was another project, which I spoke about a bit earlier, Dreaming Tower Ballroom, um, which I did some other graphics for. And it was kind of, because. The Tower Ballroom is a building. In, it's a building in Birmingham that used to be a hub for working class people to have fun, go dancing, listen to music, um, and it's a bit like it's abandoned now. So we had like the idea of animals maybe occupying it and having their own party. So we've got like the roller skating cat and like bats dancing and singing mice and stuff. So yeah, 
and that was something completely different. <laughs> yeah, um, comedy is a massive influence because I grew up with like a lot of Rick Mail because of my stepdad. Um, and then I kind of liked that irreverence and I got really into like Monty Python and that art style. And of course, goodness gracious me, which links to my South Asian heritage. Yeah, and off the back of that, I got really into making like silly little films. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you've probably seen like a big theme is anthropomorphization, <laughs> big word, <laughs> which is um, attributing human characteristics to a god, animal or object. So I work in like lots of different mediums. Um, and these are like a couple of paintings and drawings that I've done. I kind of like the idea of something twee and quite cute being mixed with something that might be mildly offensive and kind of a bit, a bit, a bit, um, a bit subversive. <laughs> yeah, and there's another one. Yeah, kind of like things that are like cute but a bit angry, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Another example of anthropomorphization. <laughs> I made a toilet sign for my cat just so he knew where he was going. <laughs> and we kind of found this in some of the enamels we looked at because um, we really loved this scene just for it, how absurd it is. It's just so absurd. Animals playing cards, like dogs playing cards. But we kind of saw them as like the top dog. And we thought that was quite, quite humorous and like a, a comment on class almost. Um, but we can also appreciate the craft that has gone into it with all the texturing and detail like how many layers of how many layers of work would that have taken like it's really um really good craftsmanship yeah the dog smoking with a little neck scarf <laughs> like absolutely absurd yeah so we like we really appreciate the beauty of these pieces as well so we kind of wanted to preserve that in our pieces that we made yeah and i think at this point i want to introduce them the stars of the show which are, it's Iris's cat Fidel on the left and my cat Chotty on the right. And we, me and Iris kind of bonded over our love for our cats and just cats in general. Um, so yeah, that was like a big talking point for us. Um, this, this is uh, another one of the pieces that are going to be um, exhibited at, on Hall Street. Because um, we had like four, four themes basically. There was class, women's work, immigration and love. And this one is kind of a reference to, it's, it's a bit speculative, so there's no concrete evidence, but there's like a rumour that enamelling came from French refugees in the 18th century. Um, so this is like a homage to that and like knitted versions of both our cats, which you can see in a close up on the right. So we had to put that in there. Yeah, this is my favourite one because I really love, um, I really love, love that whole scene with the dogs and seeing them as like the working, as in the um, upper class and the cats are kind of conspiring against these dogs. And it's just that contrast between the hard and the soft and the high, high craft and low craft, which we really wanted to get across. Yeah, and off the back of that, um, we did a workshop at Mosley Park School where I used to work in Bilston. And we've kind of got the kids to make their own things using collage techniques that I used. Um, yeah, I love the one on the right. It's like ultimate birthday speech to combat adults. I kind of like how subversive that is. And it's kind of nice that, because we wanted to preserve the idea of play being really important in creating. And I think as you grow up, you kind of get told that you need to stop playing and like do your tax returns now, pay your bills, get a job, <laughs> just get on with it. But I think play is a really important thing in innovation and. Like we're allowed to have fun as well. <laughs> yeah, just a couple of more examples. Yeah, so thank you for listening. Me and I were eating some orange chips in the cold. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Uh, so I think now we're on to John. Um, and do you, have, do you have questions that you're putting to John? Um, yeah. Yeah. So maybe I can just say I was lucky enough. Um, Yvonne Jones pointed me in John Grayson's direction. And I attended one of his talks and I was, of course, blown away by all the stuff he knows about enamel. So we got in touch with John and we thought we'd ask him some questions because we very much um, have sort of got uh, talking about enamels from a very emotional point I would say Sharon would you say that so right so we thought we best maybe get some substance 
in the matter. So I'll kick off with one of our, and John can, John, can I share this, John? So John is like the person who knows about enamels, but he also said, we need some questions because otherwise we're going to be here all night. So. <laughs> Shall I, um, I've got some images. Um, yeah. Because I know. Do you want to introduce about, yourself, so. John? Say yeah, a bit yeah. more about yeah. yourself. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to say I've had a look uh, at the attendees and it seems to be a, a long list of people I've worked with, friends, etc. So just a big hello and a big thank you. I'm not going to mention you all by name, but Andrew, Carol, Carrie, Helen, you all know who you are. And um, over the years, we've, we've had some great times. So it's great to see people, um, old faces, albeit just a name in a chat room list. <laughs> So uh, I think most of you probably know who I am because I've seen to be the person who blathers on about enamels the most. But if you don't, um, I'm John Grayson. Um, I completed my PhD looking at this genre of enamels um, in 2018. Um, I'm currently juggling a number of roles, uh, lecturer at Hereford College of Art, uh, with being um, a postdoc research fellow at BCU, Birmingham City University. Um, before that, um, I've worked at a number of institutions and also importantly, um, been a crafts maker for some 30 years probably now. I think it's all beginning to blur a bit. I've got to that time of my life. Um, by more, by, by pure kind of coincidence, it, talking to Iris, it, it actually, we, we realised we had an awful lot in common. And um, I think working out the timetable, I think I was the year before you on the yeah. MA network at, at Wolverhampton. Um, and obviously, as you said earlier, Craft Sense, you, you were in that as well. And I, I was in that. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite it's quite nice to see old faces and people that, you know, went to the same institution. And I have very fond memories of being at Wolverhampton, very fond memories. And that building, it's a Marmite building, but I think everybody who's been there and studied there loves it. So <laughs> shall I share um, my yeah. screen and then you could fire away. Hang on, let's try and make sure the tech works. Oh, hang on. I think I've done that wrong. Uh, so click on that. Share. So, Does it yeah. come up? It's coming. Is it there? Yeah. Yes. So shall I ask you the first question? Go on then, far away. The first question was really, John, how did you first get into the enamels? What started you off? So, uh, okay, so why has it not moved on? Maybe because I have to do that. There we go. Um, so, really, it all started through um, a fascination with industrial uh, decorating techniques for metal. Um, so, I'm going to show you some of the enamels that first got me inspired shortly, but, but really, it was these pieces. Uh, um, so, and, and this really maybe connects uh, with the, the MA Art and Design Network at Wolverhampton. Um, so the, these pieces that I'm showing you here, this is quite an early piece, um, all started on the MA that, that we both did. Um, and I, I had a fascination with tin toy collecting anyway up at that point. Um, and I'd done my BA at Wolverhampton um, did wood metals plastics and I specialized in craft and fine metal. Um, so I was kind of a sil using silversmithing techniques. Um, and when I went back to do my MA, I wanted to explore the value of industrial um, print techniques you, uh, within a, a craft context. Um, so through the MA, um, I contacted a number of factories because I'm really, really enthusiastic about factory visits, as will become clear later on, um, and got shown really how tin toys, printed tin boxes, um, 
how they were litho printed and then stamped and pressed uh, and the company that helped me out sent me off packing with loads of ink samples and tin sheet and through the MA I basically downsized this industrial process to make it usable within a craft context and, and I spent 10-15 years making these printed tin automata so the fishing boat was a batch production range so I had two lines which were batch production um, and then uh, working to commission so um, these pieces were made for a storytelling museum uh, in Shrewsbury it is now it was up at the WEM in a wonderful arts and crafts library um, but they've now moved to, to Shrewsbury um, and that really I suppose it was it was kind of a celebration of defunct metalworking trades from the West Midlands was kind of you know the the intrigue for me and and how stuff that was industrially printed um actually each thing although they 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 they, they are the same um because the ink the print plates would be registered in a slightly different way each time they were put through a press you, you kind of got a, a, a slight uniqueness on each thing so a classic example if you can think about old-fashioned tin toys might be like a Let's take a cat example of stamped out printed tin cat, but the eye, the printed image of the eye, not necessarily locating where the the the, the embossed dint for the eye socket was. So, so really, it was that that kind of got me started. Um, so that that was my gateway in, really. Yeah. My next question was, um, you did some work at Bilston and Battersea Enamels, and we were really curious, what was that like? So, um, I think what I'm going to say to you is getting interested in enamels comes with a health warning, because if it had the same effects on, has, has the same effects on you as it did do on me, it ended up changing my life. <laughs> to quite an obsessive level. So um, really it all started in 2004 when Bilston um, Gallery, Bilston Craft Gallery as it was then, might still be now actually, um, but the then curator um, was developing a project called Craft Sense um, uh, and it was really about helping the local community um, understand contempt or see as relevant contemporary craft by connect it, connecting it to their industrial her heritage uh, that, that was rooted in crafts making of another century, whether that's 18th century enamels or Japanware or whatever. Um, so really that was the start point. And I was, I was asked to, to make some enamel objects some contemporary enamel objects in response to the enamel collection. Um, and that um, a, a local manufacturer called Bilston Battersea Enamels, who people listening might probably aware of, they, they were the pre sole producers for Halcyon Days Enamels, the contemporary enamel. Um, so they, they basically supported the production of these things. And, and I suppose my gateway drug into all of this was the thing that you're looking at at the minute, was this tiny little patch box, which would fit in the palm of your hand inscribed a trifle from Bilston um, and I made a contemporary take on this so this this particular box is really important because one of the things is that most of the enamels if not all of them aren't marked with the manufacturer's mark but this particular one has uh, the inscription Sam Proud and the building is Sam Proud's house it's um, I think it was what they called the lunatic asylum um, I'm paraphrasing there um, and Sam Proud was related to the Beckett's and the Beckett's were one of the big enamel manufacturers within within the town of Bilston so this is a particularly important object because basically it, it's one of the few that, that we're pretty sure we can I, attribute to a particular manufacturer um, and I made that well actually I made three pieces but I've chosen the main piece which is a raspberry trifle from Bilston 
um, which basically was my modern day take on an 18th century patch box. And I was trying to think what would Bill Stonians, uh, what would their interpretation of the words a trifle from Billston be? And I kind of thought, well, maybe it would be one of those kind of mass produced trifles in a tub. You know, they're our guilty pleasure. We buy them from the supermarket. They're probably really bad for us, but gosh, do we love them? You know, so that was my take. Um, and they formed the centerpiece for Craft Sense. Um, and there was handleable sections and, and um, I think it was only supposed to have a five year lifespan and I think it's still in there now. So, but that changed my life basically. Um, yeah. Next question. <laughs> um, yeah, we're like really interested in, in like the scenes that are on in our boxes. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about them. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm quite knowledgeable about in animals. The, the, the quirky for me though, is I'm, I'm really knowledgeable about what happens under the skin of the enamel. So the metalwork techniques, um, and that was the focus for my PhD. Um, but as a consequence of spending an awful lot of time in various museum stores, including Wolverhampton Art Gallery um, and v and um, and various other museums around the country, uh, I've, I've looked at a lot of stuff and I've read a lot of stuff. So as you say, you know, the, the things that seem to intrigue you are the, the, the objects that they, they call as toys. So small metal objects were called toys in the 18th century so not toys that you would play with but 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 tiny little objects and the little patch boxes and the snuff boxes were um kind of typical of that so they tie into um the customs and the tr the fashions tastes of that period and you have to kind of think that the 18th century is like the emergence of the kind of modern world that, that we inhabit now. So you'd got um, increasingly wealthy middle classes, you got the upper classes, um, and they wanted to buy accoutrements. They wanted objects for their homes. Um, there was a rise in dining and entertaining, tea drinking, snuff taking, um, and the wearing of patches. So if you don't know what they are, that, that obviously is the little black silk um, dots that you wear on your face, so you, you, you'll you'll um, you'll have seen them in the countless period dramas that that we have on the telly. Um, and the the enamels were kind of surfaces to to kind of present a number of different images on them. Um, and I think the ones that you like are, are these ones that kind of have these kind of curious scenes where you've got. Um, uh, people in embraces, um, kind of love scenes, kind of um, some of them are depictions of kind of um, fashionable plays at the time. And I think what, what's important to understand is kind of boxes like this, the images on them, um, they, they, they were exemplifying the tastes of the day and, and owning stuff like this was seen as sophisticated. So the imagery in a sense, um, exemplified sophistication, so neoclassical kind of styling, uh, scenes of, of um, kind of the aristocracy, the elites, um, and so on. Um, and some of them, I, 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 the images that I'm showing are, are ones that I photographed, but there are some curious ones where there are kind of like couples in embraces with, with kind of, um, uh, what would you get? Voyeuristic things going on with little boys peering around bushes and kind of like seeing what's going on. And some of them are, are particularly risque and um, quite quite smutty. I haven't got any to show, but there are some where there's kind of quite innocuous scenes on the box tops, and then you open the lid, um, and there's just a, a kind of painted scene on the inside, but what you realise is it's a false bottom, and when you take the false bottom out, um, 
there's a, a, a painting of, uh, shall we say, a couple going at it, hammer and tongs. And so these were kind of like, you know, smutty things that after dinner, the ladies would retire to the drawing room and the men folk could amuse themselves looking at 18th century porn, I suppose. I don't know. Um, so I'm kind of like, as I said, I can talk for Britain about this stuff, but um, so I've got a few here that I just find curious. Those, these two earlier ones, they're, they're both thought to be Birmingham made, but attribution is so difficult, so it's not, it's not conclusive. This is thought to be a Bilston one, probably because the, the print is a bit more naive. The assumption is that, 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 that the naiver stuff came out of the town, but actually in reality, it's been proven by many scholars that that was a kind of um, 19th century connoisseur collector's kind of uh, assumption really the trade was huge in Bilston um, and it's quite clear they were making some pretty sophisticated wear along along with the kind of more cheap and cheerful stuff so wonderful tea caddies painted um, these little scent bottles um, with uh, actor and actress painted on them um, I'm rattling through curious stuff like this so this is for entertaining at home so we've got these mustard pots um, so yeah, so th those are that kind of a whistle stop tour of enamels from Bilston. <laughs> so I think your last question, do you want to fire away? Yeah. Um, what do you think the future of enamel could be? Well, you're probably talking to the wrong person there because obviously I'm obsessed about it. So I think there's lots of potential in the enamels, but you know, um, for me, and I think maybe interestingly for you, you know, you're intrigued by the kind of 18th century imagery, the inscriptions, and you're drawing parallels between then and now. And I think that was one of the things that drew me to them in 2004. You know, that it was a couple of hundred years ago, but things didn't seem to be so different, you know. Um, so I'm just going to kind of talk through some of the things that I've done, kind of in a way appropriating the imagery from enamel boxes and also appropriating the techniques for the metalworking uh, that is underneath the enamels, um, which was the focus of my PhD. And, and these couple of pieces here I'm just going to show, and I think Helen's on, on the Zoom. Um, we worked on this together. It, it was one of my favourite projects of all time. Um, we talked for, for a number of years about collaborating and when we finally did it, it was a great project. Um, so basically the, the nuts and bolts of this project was that Wolverhampton has the second biggest collection of enamels in the country. The biggest is in the V&A and it built, uh, the Wolverhampton probably has the biggest one of stuff that relates to Bilston. Um, and I knew through spending time in the stores that there was a lot of kind of componentry things that it wasn't possible to exhibit because for us scholars and for the heritage professionals and what have you you know museum curators they're really valuable but for members of the public they'd look at some of these things and think well what is this round round disc this broken chipped thing so myself and Helen had this great idea that basically we'd um, try to incorporate old 18th century enamels from the collection into new objects. And I'd make these new objects, but we worked with the community to come up. We, we worked together. We did some handling sessions um, with the public and they came up with start points for crazy stories, which basically I run with. So this is the, this one's called Tinderbox. It's like a voyeuristic automata. Um, the image, the, this little disc here is an 18th century enamel and it's got a loving couple in an embrace. So I imagine this was a lid off some kind of voyeuristic box that you could pull the lid and you turn the handle and this lady, uh, she reveals herself to you, shall we say. Um, and it's emblazoned with text speak, which plays out um, a kind of loving relationship kind of all goes wrong and all the kind of, um, chat around that so I'll let you work out the text speak on that. Um, so you're going to move on and this was another one. Um, 
this this box on the right hand side had a massive chip in it this is this is charlotte sir george's wife um she was said to be an avid snuff taker um, and this box got this massive chip out the top of it. And one of the, the members of the public said, oh, it, it may, maybe she was shot by George in a man random fit of rage. So this box on the left hand side, it actually had no lid. And I made a new lid and create this image of jo George with his, his smoking musket. Um, and then this kind of brings us to the present day. So um, last two pieces are made a kind of I work I'm, I'm passionate about satire and topical uh, narratives so these two pieces basically are, are all around Brexit and this piece was commissioned by the Crafts Council for their permanent collection um, if you go on their website you can see a great video of that um, but for today I've just got a, an image here of the insides which doesn't get shown so much so this is um, analog mechanics um, coupled with Arduino and motion sensors. And, and my knowledge was acquired for doing this from working in a residency at King's College London. Um, so this is charting Brexit. This is pre-Brexit. Um, and this is post-Brexit. So this is Le Brexitus a Petit Talon, which was a bit of a nod to uh, Theresa May. Um, and it kind of depicts all the trivial and not so trivial goings on around Brexit before and after. Um, so I think there's lots of value in the enamels. Uh, it's been a life's work so far for me. Um, and it's, it, I've resurfaced this lost making technique and, and basically developed a whole new way of working with enamel, which hopefully I think um, will be beneficial to craft makers in the future. Uh, as well as writing an awful lot of history papers about enamels. So yeah, there we go. Overrun slightly, I told you I would. Apologies, but I hope that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. We forgot to introduce sure. you. We're going to introduce you as the man who could be for many century. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gavin mentioned that before, and I thought that would be a really good introduction. <laughs> that was great. It's just been so wonderful to hear about um yeah all each of your your practices individually and um and kind of how they they relate to the to the enamels in our collection in, in Wolverhampton we've got so many of them kind of precious jewel-like things and uh I think some of the things you picked out around the slogans and the kind of humor theatricality in the designs um it's really interesting to hear how they kind of continue to, to resonate today. I really think they do. Um, and it was great to get a sneak peek of some of your the work um, for Bilston as well. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that up, up in the town. Um, I guess, uh, I suppose, if anyone has any questions, um, then do pop them in the chat. We've got one there already um, from Linda. So uh, she says, interested in personal archives as the stuff we keep in memory of a time or a person in precious little boxes. I wonder if anything found in them besides patches. So yeah, I'm sure there's uh, all sorts of things probably. <laughs> Haven't gone rummaging through the ones we have in the collection, but. <laughs> shall, shall I kick off or yeah, I, yeah, wanna, yeah. I mean go, John. I mean I've I've had a rummage through a fair few actually surprisingly <laughs> I the only thing that I've ever come across actually was a, a, fold, a little tiny folded up letter that actually related to one of the collectors that have bought it bought this particular item um in the 90 uh, in the 20 uh, late 20th century that's the only thing I've ever found um, you know in your collection or anywhere else mm -hmm. um, I did um, I followed different different um, historians and uh, one particular um, person who works over at De Montford uh, she she bought a, a little um, patch box um, and she posted online that when it when it arrived that she bought it from an auction site and and it did actually have the the black taft patches in it mm. um and that caught my eye because it, it you know 
I've not actually come across that as yet. It's not to say that there aren't any out there, but surprisingly, very little. It, it just from all the ones I've come across, it's just been the the boxers themselves. So, so yeah, I don't know, Iris, whether or Sharon, whether you've you came across any because obviously I haven't been through every single item in the stores, but. I mean, for us, it's been a real sort of bit of an online project because it was locked down. It was very much made in lockdown. But I have to say the treasure of looking at the Wolverhampton collection, just do it. That's all I can say. Just do it. Hours later, you still be there. Amazing. I mean, thank you to Yvonne Jones to point me in the first direction there. And then Sharon did and me were online. And it's that treasure and that thinking. I was thinking as well of what people may be putting them now and what you would... What would be the equivalent because we're so much in this digital age especially through the lockdown so i don't know sharon did over yeah. to you we've kind of had like a few like pro like funny ideas like um like you get the perfume boxes the perfume um containers it'll probably be hand sanitizer instead the perfume during the pandemic um yeah we're kind of just interested in how that can maybe be used in the future in an accessible way for people. Yeah. And I think you also, in the first mock-ups, you put a cat in one of them, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we were playing around first. So it, you want to put stuff in them, I think. And also for me, one thing, the lids I found really interesting. There's some photographs on the Wolverhampton collection where there's the lid, what the drawing inside the lid is often very beautiful, I saw. It's sort of like a extra mm, hidden thing. Mm -hmm, hidden, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of them are just plain inside, but others you open them up and there's, you know, a lovely transfer print or a little painted, mm -hmm. you know, inscription. Sometimes there's like little insects and stuff like that. And famously, um, quite often it's thought that um, when there was like a little bug painted on it, was that. Like, painted over a, a misfiring so a way of clawing back you know not losing an object if you've got a bit of grit on on the surface of the enamel you kind of disguise it as a little little insect or something like that um but yeah it, it, it's i i mean I, I love going into stores i think museum collections are just amazing and in a way i i just i, I actually find what's in the stores more fascinating that, than what's on display because in a sense <laughs> The, what's on display is kind of curated quite rightly so for 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 a kind of um telling a story or a mass appeal for the audience you know but it, you go into a store you you kind of get to see everything the warts and all as it were you know that everything that's been acquired and sometimes it's the most disregarded things that I find the most fascinating you know so yeah I, I just love going in stores and I'm forever grateful for all the curators around the country that you know spend time to allow allow people like us in because like you know I know especially with all the cuts over the years you know it, it, it's it's they've got a supervisors and it it's time out of their day so you know I, I think big thanks to to people like that for accommodating us you know well, I think it's great to share it all and uh, get it all out there as as much as we can I think um, Definitely. We've got a question, another question from Leanne. Um, what is the metalwork like underneath the enamel? Um, curious as to the finish, etc. So this was the thing that fascinated me. So if you think back to the trifle from Bilston work, um, as a metal worker, <clears throat> once, I, once I became immersed in what was in the stores, um, I kept coming across these really complicated three-dimensional forms um, and as a metal worker I kept thinking oh I wonder how these are made because one of the things you have to think is that enamel is like glass that you melt, melt onto the surface of the copper um, and copper and uh, sorry enamel and solder don't mix the melt points are exactly the same um, so I, th I thought well let you know how are they joined together, these things, all these different components? And I just spent ages, you know, acquiring books and reading them, thinking, well, it's so blindingly obvious, it must be in something. And, it, and it, I never found it. 
And what I didn't realise until I did a PhD was that I'd found a knowledge gap. <laughs> but I didn't know that that was what it was called then. And I was doing a literature search and I didn't know what, that I was doing that, but I was. Um, and, and that really was once I realised that nobody would really thought about it, I basically investigated that. And um, for me, um, I, I spent ages asking curators to get me all the broken enamels out of stores and they were the things that fascinated me because the broken enamels gave you an unintended window to see the co copper construction. So basically it's a number of components that are tied together with copper uh, ribbons or folded together, crimped together very, very cleverly. Um, and then what happens is when the enamels then um, painted over the surface and fired onto it, it completely hides all of these seams. So every time you see a complicated object like the mustard pots uh, with the suits of armor heads, that, that's probably like six or seven separate components all tied together and then covered over with enamel so you can't see it. Um, question from Carrie. Uh, she asks, does the thought of museum curators in a hundred years time finding your work in stores influence what you make and which political issues you make work in response to now? Mm. Iris, do you want to go for that? <laughs> well, I think Actually, this is like, I produce a lot of work. So this was really like a thing. This was something we could just make for us as well and have our real joy with it. So I think for me, it's always about the authentic voice. So it's about what we feel. So I don't really think about the curate anyways. I think I'm interested. I love the idea of people finding it because it would be very confusing because it's that sort of like our work, I think it's going to be on aluminium based print. Imagine it's been taken down and it's in a store in a hundred years. I think people would be very confused because we mix all lots of different things together and the knitted cats, I think, confuse everybody. And then, I don't know, Sharon, what do you think? And our political, we, we I think we were very, um, women's history is to me very important because it's always been written out, women always, do a lot of work on decorations and stuff, but they then also objectified on the pieces. So that's very important. Um, diversity in immigration as well. I was very struck that of the idea that the Huguenots maybe did the metal work. There is maybe there's this sort of idea maybe, or that it started with them because I come from an area where there's also Huguenot and think maybe have some Huguenot blood. So just fascinated by different people coming together, coming with skills, putting it together. I think that's me trying to do it. Yeah, I think it's like, I think it's like we're just trying to piece together a bit of a history. Um, and it was kind of just like, it was kind of fun investigating where things have come from and not quite knowing where they've come from and trying to find a way to find out. And I think in some ways we've, we've kind of filled the gaps in so it'll be a bit like Chinese whispers, like we think something's happened and someone else, someone else take that for granted and be like, oh yeah, that's what happened. And then they'll go on thinking that that's what happened and then t they'll turn it into something different. So it feels like an ongoing thing, a bit like Chinese whispers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's an, it's an odd thought, isn't it? A hundred years time. We got got... Um... Yeah. Another, another question from Yuta saying, uh, I'm still not sure how the enamel is made. You talked about prints. Um, so is there one designer slash painter that does the design or is each one um, painted by an individual worker? So I guess what the kind of process is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, obviously try to crunch this into a really short space <laughs> of time. Um, so in terms of decoration, I, I mean, probably the first thing is, is try, uh, remember that enamel is, uh, when it comes to the chemistry of enamel, it's, it's pretty much um, allied to ceramics. So decorating techniques in the enamel trade, very similar to decorating methods in the ceramic trade, if you're familiar with that. So when it comes to prints, what we're talking about there is a process called transfer printing. 
which is basically where you, they would engrave a copper plate with an image. They would wipe enamel ground down in finely ground enamel ink in inverted commas um, into the uh, engraving. They would put tissue paper over the top of that or a glue bat as they call it, which is like um, or a thin rubber block. And they would put that through a printing press. So it would print the enamel image from, from the copper onto the paper. And then the paper could be a, then pressed onto the surface of your enamel. Um, and because the paper's flexible, it would, it would allow the print, printed image to be transferred onto a, a curvaceous form. So that's, that's basically why it's called transfer printing. And then, then it would be fired probably about 800 degrees um, for three or four minutes um, and, and the image would then become fast. Um, the painted stuff depends on the on the kind of sophistication. Um, you probably, again, it's very difficult. There's not a lot written about the trade contemporary to the time. But um, what we think is that some of the high end stuff would have been the work of single master craftsmen. Um, but there was probably also some kind of um, division of labor going on. So you've got a uh, workforce putting what we call colored grounds. So that's just basically a base coat of colored enamel on, um, and then probably passing it on to, to a particular craftsman to, to do the high end kind of um, painting. Um, but yeah, there, there's very little if written about it. If if you want an interesting read, I'd point people to Angerstein's diary, um, who was an industrial spy who came to the UK and he spent some time in Bilston and Wensbury. Didn't write too many entries, but what he did write is quite interesting. Um, so yeah. Um, it's a question from Carol to follow up on that point, um, do you think that some examples of decoration on enamels could be considered fine art? Well, I'd say they're decorative art, but in the day, they probably, they might well have been because some of the prints were, were engraved by um, particularly esteemed engravers of the time. So Ravenet was one, Hancock was another, who was associated with Worcester porcelain. So in a, in a sense, some of the images and some of the printer engravers that were producing them were thought of as being fine artists in that sense, you know. But in the way that we use the word fine art in the contemporary um, use of the word, maybe not, but hey, that's like everything, isn't it? Things change with time. It's also something that gets redefined, doesn't it? What is fine art and what isn't? And yeah, some of yeah. them are truly exquisite, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We've got um, one more question. I think we'll make this, this one the last one because I'm conscious that we, we're um, a bit late running uh, this evening. Um, a question from John who asks, were there any connections with um, 18th century miniaturist painters? So, so uh, in, in Europe, Northern Europe, France, um, there was in the 18th, uh, the 17th century, um, they were particularly known for some exquisite miniature enamel paintings on precious metal. Um, and some of those crafts people or artists moved to the UK, people like Petitot, I believe. Um, but they painted, the, the technique is basically the same, but they painted onto gold. You know, they made real high-end work for uh, royalty and aristocrats. They were really, really expensive. Um, and the actual boxes that they were put on were, ba were very simple. They were usually just a dished kind of half round form. So really what you need to think is that the painting techniques are kind of the same, but the thing with the Bilston where the when stuff made in Wensbury, stuff made in Birmingham was really, it was early industrial manufacturing. It was scaling up, producing mass produced items 
using early industrial techniques and division of labour. Um, and, and a lot of it to kind of ape the fashionable porcelain, but making using different techniques. Um, so the processes are kind of allied, but it's not the same and there didn't seem to be the same people involved. Great, thank you. I think um, we could uh, wrap wrap up for the evening if you're happy to do so. So uh, thank you so much uh, to Sharon, Jit, Iris, John um, for sharing your insights and your work. It's been, yeah, fascinating. Um, really nice event. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. Much. Thank you for having <laughs> us. Yep. And thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, thank you. That was very nice. I mean, can, can we have a follow up sometime in a, a year's time, see how the Pilston project has got on? That yeah. would be nice, I think. Why not? Mm. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk to Gavin. Yeah. Oh, and thanks to Gavin as well. I think he's gone, but thanks to <laughs> Thank you. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs>